Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. In this part 2 of my e-lecture on spontaneous preterm labor, I am going to discuss the management of preterm labor. I request you to watch part 1 before watching this video. When it comes to management of spontaneous preterm labor, the first thing that comes to my mind is that not all cases need treatment. It must be remembered that many cases of preterm labor are related to a serious disorder and it may be best to actually encourage early birth in some conditions to spare the mother or her fetus. When considering tocolytic therapy to prolong pregnancy, certain absolute and relative contraindications must be considered. Absolute contraindications are those conditions in which prolongation of pregnancy is contraindicated per se. For example, clinically apparent intrauterine infection, known lethal fetal congenital malformation, severe preeclampsia, and any other urgent fetal maternal indication for delivery. Relative contraindications are those conditions in which debate exists about the risk and benefits of interventions such as antepartum hemorrhage, ruptured membranes, non-reassuring fetal heart rate pattern on cardiotrochography, intrauterine growth restriction, insulin-dependent diabetes, and multiple pregnancy. General measures which are taken to treat spontaneous preterm labor are Rest in bed in head low position may be given to reduce the pressure of the presenting part on the lower uterine segment. However, there is no evidence to prove that this is beneficial. There is no evidence that hydration as an independent factor is effective. One must avoid sedatives like pethidine because they may accelerate labor and they may depress the fetus. Repeated vaginal examinations must be avoided to prevent introduction of infection or to prevent stimulation of labor. A variety of pharmacological agents are used to arrest uterine contractions, but they lack uterospecificity, have low efficacy and or have potentially serious side effects for the mother or the fetus. There is no clear first-line tocolytic medication. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in their evidence-based guideline on preterm labor recommend that it is reasonable not to use any tocolytic drug as there is no clear evidence that they improve outcome. A similar sentiment is expressed by Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists from Canada. Despite this, tocolytics are used in modern obstetrics to allow maternal administration of antenatal steroids, thereby helping to reduce the incidence of respiratory distress in delivered infants and facilitate in utero transfer of the fetus to a tertiary care center if necessary. I will now discuss the different tocolytics that can be used in preterm labor. I will first talk about beta mimetics. The commonly used beta sympathomimetic drugs for treatment of spontaneous preterm labor are terbutalin and retodrin hydrochloride. Terbutalin is given subcutaneously in a dose of 0.25 mg every 20 minutes for 4 to 6 doses. It should be withheld if pulse rises above 120 beats per minute. Intravenous mode of administration of terbutalin has been abandoned because of its unacceptable cardiovascular side effects such as pulmonary edema. The oral route has been clearly shown to be ineffective. Retotin hydrochloride is given initially in the dose of 50 to 100 micrograms per minute intravenously, which should be increased by 50 micrograms per minute every 10 minutes until contractions cease or side effects develop. 
the maximum dose of retrotin hydrochloride is 350 micrograms per minute please note isoxyprene is not used for treatment of preterm labor in modern obstetrics the recommended guidelines for monitoring the patients during an intravenous administration of beta mimetics are as follows monitor pulse and blood pressure every 15 minutes auscultate the chest every 4 hours strict input and output charts should be measured for fluid balance urea electrolytes and hematrocytes should be measured every 24 hours maternal blood glucose should be measured 4 hourly beta mimetic drugs are associated with severe maternal side effects like pulmonary edema myocardial ischemia arrhythmia and death although hyperglycemia and hypokalemia are recognized complications there is no need to administer insulin for hyperglycemia and potassium for hypokalemia unless the patient is known to be diabetic or requires immediate surgery calcium channel blockers like nifedipine is recommended by royal college of obstetricians and gynecologists in preference to beta mimetics the doses schedule is as follows initial loading dose of 20 to 30 mg followed by 10 to 20 mg every 4 to 8 hours until uterine contractions subside side effects of calcium channel blockers are flushing headache dizziness hypertension and peripheral edema though rare serious side effects including myocardial infarction and deaths have been reported with the use of nifedipine especially in women with cardiovascular disorders fetal effects like sudden fetal death and fetal distress have also been reported with calcium channel blockers atosiban an oxytocin antagonist represents an advance in currently available tocolytics and should be considered a first line tocolytic for the management of spontaneous preterm labor atosiban is licensed in europe for treatment of spontaneous preterm labor however it is not available in india and not approved in united states the recommended doses and administration schedule for atosiban is as follows initial bolus dose of 6.75 mg over 1 minute followed by an infusion of 18 mg per hour for 3 hours and then 6 mg per hour for up to 45 hours the duration of treatment should not exceed 48 hours and the total dose given during a full course should preferably not exceed 330 mg of atosiban only more minor temporary side effects like nausea headache and allergic reactions have been reported with atosiban another drug which is sometimes used for treatment of spontaneous preterm labor is endomethacin it is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor and is given in a loading dose of 50 mg rectally or 50 to 100 mg orally and then 25 to 50 mg orally every 6 hours for 48 hours the dose must not exceed 200 mg per day it is contraindicated in women with significant renal or hepatic impairment prolonged use for greater than 72 hours or if given after 32 weeks it can result in fetal adverse effects like premature closure of ductus arteriosus necrotizing enterocolitis respiratory distress syndrome and bronchopulmonary dysplasia and a potential increase in the risk of development of periventricular leukomalacia especially at a dose greater than 200 mg it may be used as a first line agent in preterm labor secondary to polyhydramnios as it also reduces the formation of amniotic fluid however evidence for this is lacking there is no evidence to support the use of magnesium sulfate as a tocolytic a cochrane review has concluded that magnesium sulfate is ineffective in delaying preterm birth 
or preventing preterm birth. Magnesium sulfate was popular for tuberculosis in the United States and some other parts of the world but is rarely used for this indication in Europe and it is not recommended for tuberculosis. However, as per recent evidence, there is a new indication for use of magnesium sulfate in preterm labor, not as a tocolytic but for fetal neuroprotection. For women with imminent preterm birth from viability that is 23.6 weeks to 31.6 weeks, antenatal magnesium sulfate administration should be considered for fetal neuroprotection, a level 1A evidence. For this, it should be administered as a 4 grams intravenous loading dose over 30 minutes followed by 1 gram per hour maintenance infusion until birth. Nitric oxide donors such as glycerin trinitrate can also be used for treatment of spontaneous preterm labor. It is used as a 10 mg patch for every 12 hours continuing until contraction cease up to 48 hours. Currently, there is insufficient evidence to support routine administration of nitric oxide donors. For more information on tocolytics, please refer to my book Modern Obstetrics where I have discussed the merits and demerits of various tocolytics in great detail. Before I conclude, I will talk briefly about the role of progesterone in prevention of preterm birth. There is conflicting opinion in this regard. I follow the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine recommendations regarding use of progesterone in prevention of preterm birth. In asymptomatic singleton pregnancy with prior spontaneous preterm birth, 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone in a dose of 250 mg intramuscularly weekly is given from 16 to 20 weeks until 36 weeks. In asymptomatic singleton pregnancy without prior spontaneous preterm birth but with cervical length less than or equal to 2 cm at less than or equal to 24 weeks gestation, vaginal progesterone 90 mg gel or 200 mg suppository daily from diagnosis of short cervix until 36 weeks is recommended. In multiple gestations, symptomatic preterm labor and preterm premature rupture of membranes, there is no evidence that progesterone is effective. I will now summarize the guidelines for tocolysis in the treatment of preterm labor. After a determined period of time, that is 48 hours, tocolytic therapy is usually discontinued because prolonged use of tocolysis may increase the maternal fetal risk without offering a clear benefit. There is no clear first-line tocolytic medication. RCOG recommends atosiban along with nifedipine as first-line agent in the management of preterm labor. Tocolytic agent of choice of most obstetricians and perinatologists in United States is magnesium sulfate. However, this is changing. Terbutalin is currently the most commonly used beta sympathomimetic. Little evidence exists that any tocolytic medication can effectively prolong gestation longer than 2 to 7 days. No clear evidence exists that combining tocolytic drugs improves efficacy. Combining tocolytic agents potentially increases the risk of maternal and neonatal complications and must be avoided. No clear evidence exists that maintenance tocolysis increases gestational age at birth, increases birth weight or effectively prolongs pregnancy and therefore it must be avoided. Now I will talk about antipartum glucocorticoids in treatment of spontaneous preterm labor. Prolonging gestation with tocolytic therapy allows for administration of antipartum 
glucocorticoids to reduce the incidence and severity of respiratory distress syndrome and hence to reduce neuronal morbidity and mortality a single course of glucocorticoids should be administered between 24 to 34 weeks gestation it consists of two doses of 12 mg of beta methazone given intramuscularly 24 hours apart or four doses of 6 mg of dexamethasone given intramuscularly 12 hours apart based on observational and clinical and animal studies beta methazone is preferable to dexamethasone multiple courses of corticosteroids should be avoided what about antibiotics should antibiotics be used in spontaneous preterm labor the answer is yes and no as per oracle study antibiotic treatment is recommended only in the presence of premature rupture of membranes to prevent chorioamnionitis empirical use of antibiotics in patients with spontaneous preterm labor without rupture of membranes is not recommended however if vaginal swab culture is positive for group b streptococcus antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent group b streptococcus sepsis in the newborn is recommended in women with preterm labor intrapartum chemoprophylaxis for group b streptococcus should be intravenous penicillin given at 4 hourly intervals and if the patient is allergic to penicillin then a combination of erythromycin or clarithromycin or clindamycin is recommended in conclusion i will say that the ultimate goal of management of spontaneous preterm labor should not be to merely prolong pregnancy but to improve neonatal outcome and to reduce morbidity and mortality for further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology refer to following books written by me practical obstetrics and gynecology modern obstetrics modern gynecology clinical cases in obstetrics questions and answers clinical cases in gynecology questions and answers and pelvic reconstructive surgery if you have found this video useful and informative please subscribe to my youtube channel by clicking here